great. Thanks. Thanks, John. So morning, everybody. And, uh, you know, as usual, it's hello from me. I'm the large disembodied head who apparently is always grumpy and sits in the corner scaring at John. And uh, it's hello from me. I'm the uh, <laughs> very, very tall, very slender one. Yeah. You can yes. see there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, I've gone from fat side to thin side, and I'm heading back to fat side now. So, you know, prob probably, you know, you know, th th this is this is John, you know, and this is pro this is probably me to scale. I'm not sure I like what's hanging down between my legs there, Simon. That's not quite to scale. <laughs> oh, sorry, I made that too big, John. I made yeah. your legs a bit longer. There you go. That's that's probably us to scale. Um, OK, so as usual, protocols, if you can uh, mute your mics, please. Um, raise any questions via chat. John will be keeping an eye on uh, the chat and uh, he'll be letting people in. And so if you've got a question, uh, raise it on the chat. And um, at the end of the uh, of the presentation, um, we will make the slides and the videos uh, available as usual. Uh, the video goes up onto our uh, YouTube channel, and um, the slides go onto our Scarecrow's uh, knob or knowledge base, um, which, you, if you haven't already got access, you can ping us an email um, via our website, and we'll send you the link to that, and you can download the presentations. Um, and if I make any notes, which I, I'm expecting to do, so it'll be the uh, the uh, annotated version. Uh, okay. So today's topic is something called the evidence pattern. But before we get into a specific pattern, we're going to take a step back and actually talk about what we mean by a pattern in terms of, of sort of systems engineering and, and where patterns come from. We're going to touch briefly on the approach that we use to documenting patterns. Um, I have a very, very quick whiz through of patterns that are available for people uh, to use. Uh, most of them are available on our knowledge base, not all, but most of them are. And, and then we'll finish off by looking at one pattern in particular, the evidence pattern. Um, which hopefully you know will will, will uh, be of use to people, but also uh, inspire people perhaps to to think about patterns themselves. Um, anybody that's a member of uh, Incozy um, in the UK, uh, we have a model-based systems engineering interest group, and we have a patterns work stream in that. So we're always keen for people to um, suggest and um, contribute to that work if possible. So, what do we mean by a pattern? Well, the term pattern stems originally from uh, the world of, of, of building architecture. Back in uh, the late 70s, an architect called Christopher Alexander wrote uh, a seminal uh, work called A Pattern Language. And what he identified was common architectural problems that occur over and over again. Um, and came up with a sort of core solution that could be used in architecture, in building architecture, to address those problems, um, but in such a way that they weren't prescriptive in, in terms of saying you must do it like this. It was more the concepts and the ways of thinking about the solution so that you could use this, as he says, use the solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. Um, those ideas eventually made their way into the software engineering object oriented community with a, a very uh, well known book, which is, uh, as far as I know, still in print, called Design Patterns. It's known as the Gang of Four book. Uh, there's four people that wrote it Cameron, Helm, Johnson, and Vlasides, um, published in 1995, widely used in, in um, software engineering. A lot of um, UML, SysML tools um, have those patterns built into them. For anybody that's familiar with the Sparks Enterprise architecture, it's got all of those patterns uh, built in. So very, very seminal work, still in print, very important. And those ideas were extended in, in very short order. First by a, a guy called uh, Day, who um, brought out a book on um, patterns for data modeling 
And then uh, Martin Fowler, who some of you may well be aware of through his uh, UML Distill book and other books like that. He did a book on um, sort of business analysis, really, analysis patterns, but all building on that Gang of Four uh, book. And now the, um, the, the concepts of, of a pattern have been uh, um, adopted in the wider systems engineering community. So they, it's made a jump from architecture to software to systems engineering. Now, at Scarecrow, we talk about enabling patterns. And an enabling pattern is a, it's a set of modeling elements related to each other, designed um, in such a way that they can be used um, to, to enable you to achieve a certain systems engineering goal. So that might be a pattern for defining interfaces or a pattern for ensuring traceability or like we're doing today, a pattern that's about evidence and arguments and, and things. So essentially, it is a set of related concepts designed because we have noticed that we are doing the same thing over and over again. And it's a, a way of capturing that knowledge so that we're not reinventing the solution every time. We have it as a sort of off the shelf pattern that we can turn to when we come across that problem. And for um, a big definition of patterns, uh, we've got a book uh, called Foundations for Model Based Systems Engineering, which came out in 2016. Um, all of the references are there at the end of the presentation, so uh, you'll get full references at the end, uh, in which we discuss all of those patterns. Now, when, when you're defining a pattern, you know, if, we, if we're doing model-based systems engineering and you're, you're defining patterns to help you do your model-based systems engineering, it makes sense to define those patterns in a, a model-based way. And we do the same thing. Uh, again, many people on the call will probably be familiar with this, but for those of you that aren't, we have a, um, a framework, an architecture framework for creating architecture frameworks called the FAF. The framework for architecture frameworks. Uh, John and I developed it, quite hugely, that long ago, seven years ago now. Um, and that framework was created by us because we, we'd started doing work where we were creating frameworks. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll just say it was actually, FAF was about seven years ago, but the origins of that was in the architecture book that we wrote about that, that's right, 12 not, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm just reaching up to get it, actually, to look at the date because I can't remember. Yeah, that, that uh, was, uh, God, that was when we were still brass bullet. We must be going back sort of 12 oh, years. 2010, or? it was published. There we go, 10 years ago. So. 10 years ago. Yeah, crikey. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, the origins, you know, 10 years ago, the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of codification and the final version seven years ago. Um, uh, and the, we use the FAF, uh, you know, across lots and lots of different uh, engineering domains. We're working it, using it with lots of our uh, customers. Um, and it's designed specifically to improve the definition of architectural frameworks to give us, Scarecrow, and, and anybody that wants to use the FAF, a model-based way of defining architectural frameworks. Now, the FAF can also be used to define enabling patterns because essentially the structure of an enabling pattern, the concepts behind it, as we'll see on the next slide, are exactly the same. They're, they're all, uh, the relationship between them is essentially, um, you can think of um, a pattern sort of like a mini framework, um, but more particularly frameworks can be built up of patterns. They're, they're sort of like Lego bricks that can, can form part of a bigger framework. And the FAF, um, the framework for architectural frameworks is designed to force anybody that's that's creating an architectural framework or or defining a pattern or actually even looking at whether a particular architectural framework or pattern is suitable for them um, it forces you to consider and answer six questions uh, the first question is is what's the purpose so i'll i'll, I'll I'll talk about pat. I'll use the word pattern there rather than architectural framework. So, what's the what's the purpose of the pattern? You know, what's it trying to achieve? Interface pattern is, for example, is about identifying interfaces. 
identifying what can flow between them, identifying um, uh, which bits of your system expose those interfaces. I'll talk about the evidence pattern when we come to it. So it's essentially it's a requirements exercise. And that's important because a lot of people start creating frameworks um, without really sitting down and thinking, what is it that we're trying to achieve with this framework? What, what do we need from it? Um, the second concept, uh, sorry, the second question is what concepts, what domain concepts must that pattern support? So um, we're talking about interfaces, so we've got interface, we've got system element, we've got interface connection, we've got flows, we've got um, ports that expose interfaces. So all the kind of language and the relationships between those terms, um, what are they? What language does your organization use that you need to encapsulate into that pattern? And that will be um, partly based on the answer to the first question as well. Then we come on to the concept of uh, things called viewpoints. Viewpoints are essentially the, the, the slices of those concepts that you can that you can um, work with at, uh, uh, and present. As an engineer, we we create um, instances of viewpoints, things called views, um, it, and the viewpoint is is if you like the recipe for what can appear on a view. So um, you might have a in a big framework or a big pattern, you might have a viewpoint called the organisation structure viewpoint, which would say. The only things you can show on here are organizations, um, organizations being broken down into smaller units, relationships between units, relationships between um, um, units and uh, uh, the different organizations, but you can't put anything else on. So on an organizational structure view, you couldn't put a system on, for example. So the viewpoints are sort of the recipes, the templates, if you like, for what can appear um, on um, the the uh, on the view based on the concepts that you've identified here, and those concepts are based on the answer to that question there. And the viewpoints themselves also will be based on the answer to that question there. So if you've said, okay, we we didn't do a, a pattern to capture interfaces and show what flows between them, that's suggesting a viewpoint. There's some kind of viewpoint about you know, the, the flow between interfaces. If you said our pattern's got to allow us to show which system elements um, expose which interfaces, that's potentially another viewpoint. So the viewpoints that we need um, are based on, on the answer to the requirements for the entire framework or pattern. And that gives us, uh, as a sanity check, if you like, the purpose for each viewpoint. So that will tie back to there. So typically, the purpose for each viewpoint will be a subset of the purpose for the entire the entire pattern. And then we define the viewpoint. So that's saying, OK, we, we've, we've identified these viewpoints that are important to us. Which concepts from here and the relationships between them can appear on each viewpoint? So that's defining the um, uh, the, the viewpoint in terms of what can appear on it. And then finally, we've got sort of rules that constrain the use. So that might be you always have to have an instance of this viewpoint. If you've got this one on, you might have to have this other one. So it's sort of minimum viewpoints, um, relationships between them to make sure that when you're using that pattern or framework, you're doing it in, in a robust way um, that's fitting in with the intent of the pattern. So Essentially, so the FAF, you know, what's my pattern got to do for me? What concepts has it got to encapsulate? Which, what ways do I do I do I need to look at those concepts? Um, define what can go on those ways, those viewpoints, and come up with some rules to constrain it. And that sits then on this this diagram here, which some of you may have seen. We call this MBSE in a slide, um, and it sits over on the approach side, the FAF does, because the FAF is an architectural framework, and architectural frameworks are made up of an ontology, a set of domain concepts and the relationships, and a set of viewpoints that are based on them, and a process set that tells you how to use that framework. 
So the FAF sits over on that approach. And also the things that the FAF defines, because the FAF is there to define frameworks and patterns, which themselves are ontologies and viewpoints. So the FAF sits over in the approach, and it's actually used to define your own approach to doing MBSC. And just to make things interesting, the FAF is actually defined using the FAF, which is a little bit mind bending, um, but just in a similar way that the that the unified modeling language on which SysML is based, the UML is actually defined using UML, it bootstraps itself. So the FAF is the same and it has um, it has six viewpoints. It's uh, unsurprisingly, um, and each viewpoint corresponds to uh, one of the one of the six questions. I'm not going to go through what the viewpoints are particularly now. Um, what you'll see in the next section, you'll see an instance of of that the, the thing we call the ontology definition view. That's the the terms and the relationships between them. Um, I'm not going to go through the other um, viewpoints um, in the evidence pattern. Um, we could spend a whole day doing that. So the FAF is a framework. It has an ontology. It has six viewpoints. These are the six viewpoints that make up the FAF. And it's a framework for defining your own frameworks and patterns. Now, as Scarecrow, we've created um, a number of patterns. Um, also, um, we've had uh, people outside, Stephen, who I think is on the call. Stephen, did I see you on the call? Yes. You did indeed. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, and Stephen's uh, got a, a pattern in the list as well. Um, so there's lots of patterns out there currently um, available. Um, this slide tells you where you can get them. Basically, if it says knob next to it, you can get them off our um, knowledge base. Um, if it just says HPB, that's out of our patterns book. Uh, we haven't put those ones up because they were done by our, co uh, our ex-colleague, Mike Brownsword. So uh, we've only put the, the patterns that John and I did up on the knowledge base. Um, um, and Stephen's got a pattern as well. Um, the evaluation that is pattern. available. Um, you can either get it through the Incozi IS 2019 proceedings, or you can look on my research gate. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, and we've also got a, a, another pattern um, that I'm currently uh, thinking about called the responsibility pattern, um, which I'm working on. So the, there are lots of patterns uh, available for you. All of the ones that you can download from our knowledge base are all documented in exactly the same way. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a consistent approach that we have. So once you've downloaded one, you'd be familiar with the way that we structure the documents. And, you know, I certainly urge people to have a look at them. You know, I think of, of particular interest, the, the interface pattern, and the um, traceability pattern, and the one that we're going to do today and the related one, the certification pattern, um, are, are, are definitely uh, worth looking at. Um, they're all worth looking at, but as, if you wanted to start somewhere, they're probably uh, the best three or four to start with. And, and there's Stephen's evaluation pattern as well, but uh, as he said, I'll get it off his research gate site. Um, so that's a resource for everybody. You know, please use, um, you know, it's there for free. Um, download them and have a look at them. OK, so let's spend the rest of the time looking at um, a, a single um, pattern. And we're going to have a look at a pattern called the evidence pattern. So in answer to the first question that the FAF forces you to ask, you know, what's the what's the purpose of the pattern? It's about capturing in a model based way chains of evidence and arguments um, that are made to su support claims about some subject and that subject could be anything it could be to do with testing it could be to do with fitness for for you know uh, release of a product you know it could be you know to give a slightly tongue-in-cheek example it could be a you know a child claiming that they've done their homework um, but anything where there is a subject that somebody is making a claim about what arguments and evidence do you have to back that up? 
Um, it also captures um, the the the, um, the claimant, and it allows um, counterclaims to be made um, and counter 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 counterclaims as much as you want. Um, there are four viewpoints in it, and it was developed um, by myself and a couple of other people from the Incosi UK uh, Model Based Systems Engineering Interest Group. In fact, this was the, the, I think the first product we ever published. So just to, again, just put things in, in terms of the context of the FAF, this is essentially question one, uh, the purpose. On the full definition, this purpose is captured using a, a, a use case diagram. Um, each of the six uh, FAF viewpoints is captured in a model-based way using SysML. Um, mainly using um, block definition diagrams, but also using a use case diagram. Um, so the FAF is a model based approach using a, 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 a notation SysML that defines a number of viewpoints for defining a model based approach to doing your, your, your model based systems engineering. Um, it's consistent. Um, there are there are links between all of the FAF viewpoints and answering the six questions make sure that your pattern or your framework all fits together and works in a consistent way. So we've got the evidence pattern. We've got what it's about. Let's have a look at its concepts. Now, in terms of the FAF, this diagram is actually an ontology definition view now, not viewpoint view. This is an instance of an ontology definition viewpoint. It's a view. It's an actual instance for an actual pattern now. Um, and you could ignore the, the, the stereotypes, but essentially the, the, the blocks, the ontology elements, they're the concepts um, that sit behind the evidence pattern. And the relationships between them, they're actually ontology relationships um, relate those concepts together. Now, at its oh, sorry, no, I don't need you. At its heart, I'm just going to change my pen color. At its heart is is this part here. This is the core sort of part of it. With with these as well. So the key thing is that. A claimant makes some kind of claim about a subject. So, like I say, it could be a child saying um, the claim is, you know, I've done my homework and that's made about the, the homework. So the claim is my homework, my homework's done. The subject is that is the homework. The claimant is the child. Then we have the concept of arguments and one or more arguments that uh, support the claim so they're the things that you you put in uh, that, you, that you're saying back up your claim i've done my homework look it's written in my book that, that would be an argument and we've also got the concept of, of claim argument link i'll talk about this now because it's important and also argument evidence link um so what this says is an argument supports a claim via a claim argument link. We've made the actual link and ontology element for a, a purpose I'll talk about in a moment. And we've done the same for this link over here, which links evidence to arguments. Because it's OK coming up with a number of arguments that support your claim, but you need evidence that reinforces, that establishes your argument. So, you know, the child says, I've done my homework, look, and the argument is here, look, here's my book. Um, but when you look at the book, they've just done a load of doodles. You know, there, there's no evidence there. If you look at the book and yes, they've answered the question and it's all neat, et cetera, then you've got some evidence to back up the argument. But, you know, just showing you the book isn't proof in itself because it could be full of, of, of rubbish. So, Claims are made about a subject by a claimant. A claim has to have a number of, at least one argument to, to support it. And it has to have, each argument has to have at least one piece of evidence to reinforce that argument, to, to establish the validity of that argument, if you like. 
and we call those links claim argument links and argument evidence links. Now, the reason we've made those links um, concepts in their own right, first class concepts, is because uh, of the ability to make a counterclaim. So a counterclaim is itself um, just a type of claim. OK, uh, it's actually a claim that's made by a refuter, which is a type of claimant. So actually the refuter, it's the refuter that makes the counterclaim. And the key thing is that counterclaim can counter, can, can be made against both the claim, the arguments, um, that support the claim, the evidence that reinforce the arguments, all the relationships between them, okay? Somebody might go, okay, yeah, you've made a claim, don't disagree with your claim, okay? Your argument is a valid argument, but I don't think you've made the link between them properly. So anything, the claims, the arguments, the evidence, all the relationships between them can all be refuted, can all have a counterclaim made against them, which is why we've made these five concepts here all type of this thing we call a claimable item because a counterclaim counters any one of those types of, of, of item. And similarly, um, because you can then you know, effectively counter the counter, if you like, you can make a claim then that to support a claimable item um, to, to help refute counterclaims. So we make a claim about a subject. We have arguments linked to that claim that support the subject. We have evidence linked to the arguments that reinforce um, those arguments. Somebody, a, 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 another claimant playing the role of a refuter can make a counterclaim if they don't agree with your chain of claim, argument, evidence about any of those three concepts or any of the links between them. So let's have a look at the, um, the viewpoints that we have. We have um, four viewpoints. Uh, they're very simple. Uh, we, we, we took the decision uh, when we were doing this to um, make the viewpoint simple. Uh, some people that have adopted the evidence pattern that essentially uh, linked the first three viewpoints all onto a, a single viewpoint and that's fine so you know you can define that in your version of the pattern if you want to um, and the first viewpoint is something we call um, the claim uh, definition viewpoint and it shows claims subjects and claimants and here's an example now so this is a view don't forget views are instances of viewpoints so it shows, it can only show subjects, claims, and the claimants. And again, they have to be things from the ontology. Subject, claim, and claimant. So essentially we've got that set of things on the, um, on the claim definition view, the CDV as we would call it claim definition not the viewpoint so this is a, a, a safety officer he's, he's making two claims he's making the claim he or she is making the claim that the system is safe to use and that the safety requirements have been exceeded and both of those claims are relating to the same subject which in this case is system safety uh, and don't forget, you know, th this is in a model. So each of these concepts, claim, subject would have, could have you know, lots of descriptive text behind them. They're not just the boxes and the, the pictures on the screen. The second um, viewpoint, the argument view, um, covers the sort of first link then in the chain from the claim to arguments. And it can only show claims and arguments. And it, it lists all of the arguments that support um, a, a given claim. You could have, have both claims on this diagram. I've, I've chosen just to put one for, for clarity. So we've got the claim that appears on, on this diagram here. The system is safe to use. 
and two arguments are being made to support that claim and those arguments are the system has been tested and the safety statistics are good so just to remind people um these two dependencies here are um instances of the claim argument link this thing here okay so we've got the argument viewpoint covers that bit of the ontology so the third viewpoint is the um, evidence view and this then links the evidence to the arguments so here we've got uh, for the system has been tested we've got two pieces of evidence we've got some safety case uh, results and we've got some uh, simulation results that have been done to reinforce that argument and to uh, reinforce the argument that the safety statistics are good somebody's done an analysis uh, and we've got the analysis of those safety statistics um, that to reinforce it and again these here are instances of the argument evidence link so that viewpoint covers that part of the ontology as i said there would be nothing wrong if you wanted to to certainly combine um those two and possibly that one if you wanted to we did it this way to keep it nice and clean you know on a real system there's you know lots of claims lots of arguments uh, just to keep the diagrams simple but there's nothing wrong with editing the pattern adding your own viewpoints if you want so the safety officer has claimed that the system is safe to use and the safety requirements have been exceeded they've made arguments that it's been tested and the statistics are good they've got safety case results simulation results and analysis to reinforce those arguments that is there if you like their chain of claim evidence claim argument evidence that the that the system that the uh, that, that the system um is safe now somebody can now come along and, and look at any of those things they can look at the the claims they can look at the arguments they can look at the links between arguments and claims they can look at evidence they can look at the links between the evidence and the arguments and they can refute any one of those and here's a, an example of the the fourth viewpoint the counterclaim view um, and the counterclaim view essentially um, lets you create and document counterclaims about any part of um, your uh, the, the chain of a claim argument and evidence so here we have a simulation specialist they're also a claimant but they're they're a subtype they're the refuter so they're acting in the refuter role they're making a counterclaim and don't forget counterclaims themselves are claims and they're making a counterclaim that simulation doesn't cover all cases and that counterclaim that they are making it's not against the um the, the simulation results as such it's not against the argument it's actually against the link um so what they're saying is um yeah we're happy with the simulation results as far as they go but you can't use them as proof that the system has been tested because not all cases have been covered so they're making a counterclaim against this reinforces link now this weird notation i've used here is because uh, because of the tool um what i want to do is have a um a counters dependency onto that dependency like that uh, but some tools will allow it some won't the tool that we used here doesn't allow it so i've had to go through this intermediate um, note unfortunately uh, so that's a bit of a tool issue but essentially the counterclaim counters that reinforcement um, link okay and similarly you know we could have counterclaims made against uh, against evidence so you know it might we might have a counterclaim 
that um, uh, safety case results um, um, incomplete. Um, and, and we might make that against you know, the safety case results, for example. So we can counter um, any part of the chain. And as we said, we can have, you know, counters to counters. So, um, you know, somebody could come along and go, oh, well, yes, they do. You know, the simulation does cover all of the cases because what you haven't taken to, into account is that um, these cases here we're not doing in this first, first version of the system, for example. It may be that the simulation specialist didn't know that. So we can then, you know, build up uh, another uh, counterclaim if you like, that counters the um, uh, original um, um, the original counter. And similarly, you know, because counterclaims are claims, these ca this counterclaim itself could have arguments which themselves could have evidence linked to them. So in some cases, you can end up with quite complex um, networks of claims and counterclaims. But the beauty of this and the beauty of doing this in a tool in a model based way is that we, it, it's easy to to ask the questions and it's easy to say, OK, you know, have any of any of my claims been been countered? What's been countered? Have we got any ref, refutation for that? What are the arguments? What are the evidence? It's very, very easy to do that. and It's very easy to see it visually on a diagram where we've got those kind of issues. Okay. So that was the evidence pattern. Essentially, it's four viewpoints. What am I claiming? What's it about? Who's making the claim? What arguments have I got to support the claim? What evidence have I got to reinforce my arguments? And hopefully, the, the fourth viewpoints uh, never used, but what counterclaims might somebody have of any of the, any of my chain of, of claim arguments and evidence. There is an extension to the evidence pattern that is available to our knowledge base. It's documented separately, but you have to sort of read read both to um, to understand it. And it's a thing called the certification pattern. Um, it adds an extra viewpoint essentially uh, to the uh, to the evidence pattern. Um, and it supports sort of what we call certified chains of evidence um, where you're not just making a claim with some arguments and some evidence, but there's there's a formal there's some kind of formal. We've used the term sort of certificate, but by that we mean some formal kind of acknowledgement of the argument and the evidence um, that is issued by a, a body that that is allowed to issue those things. So that could be. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, claiming I'm a member of uh, the IET. Um, my argument is, you know, I've paid my subs, my evidence is here's my membership certificate, but I could have I could have forged that membership certificate. And the certification then brings in the thing that there's a certification body that you can go to and check that that um, evidence or the arguments or, or, or often it's the combination of those things sort of acting as a single thing has some some um, formality behind it has some uh, strength behind it there's a there's a, a source that you can go to and say you know this person says he's a member he's given me the certificate he says you know you're the issuing authority have you issued it a train ticket is another example you know i'm making the claim to the guard that i can travel on the train well that ticket is essentially my argument and my evidence rolled into one with the the issuing train company behind it as the sort of certification authority so it adds that extra um, concept of certified claims and the claim certifier and also timeliness so certain um, links in that chain may only be valid for a certain uh, portion of time yes i'm a me i'm a member of in of uh, the iet or in cozy but that's only got a one year um, timeliness associated with it. After a year, if I haven't rejoined, that's an invalid um, piece of evidence. 
So it's a, it's a very, very useful extension to the evidence pattern. And again, it's available on our knowledge base. So I'm going to uh, wrap up now. So what we've talked about is the evidence pattern. Um, we've talked about um, briefly the approach to documenting patterns, a thing called the FAF, the Framework for Architectural Frameworks. Um, which forces us to, to ask questions about what's the purpose, what concepts must it capture, how do we want to be able to view those concepts, and how must we use that pattern. So, for example, for the evidence pattern, one of the rules about how we want to use that pattern says you must have at least one um, evidence view, argument view, and uh, claim definition view. And the, the, the claims that appear on the claim definition view must appear on the argument uh, view. The arguments that appear on the argument view must appear on the evidence view so that everything joins up together. There are other patterns out there, as we said, there's things like the interface pattern, the testing pattern, um, the certification pattern, which adds on to the enabling pattern. There's a thing called the epoch pattern, which is looking at um, evolutions of, of things through time. And there's a whole set of them available uh, from our knowledge base. Okay. So that's as far as I want to go today. If anybody's got any questions, we've got a couple of minutes before we're due to finish. I haven't seen any come up on the chat. If there aren't any questions, uh, then we will. Hi, Simon. Uh, hi, it's Julian, Julian hi, here. Hi, hi Simon. Yes. Uh, enjoying your presentation. Thanks. Thanks for You're that. Quick, quick question. Um, yeah, hi. hi, Julian. Uh, hi, hi. This is hi, Julian Sean. Johnson, everyone, a legend in MBSE. It's uh, nice to see you. Uh, oh, steady on, steady you. on, John, steady on. Quick question to Simon. Um, and I think I've raised this a, a while ago anyway, but I just it's worth in, in this uh, forum we have at the moment just re asking the question. Uh, how, how, um, does your evidence pattern relate to the underlying meta model of the goal structure notation? Has any work been done looking at the relationship between the two and how they compare? Uh, the really well, the short and the long answer is no. Uh, we, we haven't looked at that. OK. Um, uh, yeah, is, is the short answer. All right, no, fair enough. No, thank you. Uh, if you want to do that, Julian, that'd be an interesting thing to do. <laughs> I knew that was. That. <laughs> I knew it. Simon, it's a shame we haven't got. Is Fran on the call? I don't think he is. It's a shame yeah. we haven't got Fran because he has done uh, a lot of work modelling the uh, GSN stuff, um, and he yes, was. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote the original profile in what used to be Artisan Studio, uh, and I know that we've had. We've had talks about this before, and and I think that's part of the like your time. There's the short answer and the long answer, and I think part of the long answer is um, yeah, talk to Fran about it. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is Stephen Powley. Um, it's not so much a question, just a, a comment on um, the use of the abstract class or abstract block in. Um, the the uh, pattern ODV. Um, so it it was a while until I'd been working in models for a while until I came across this idea of abstract classes, and uh, it wasn't um, immediately obvious to me what they were or how they were useful. And so I don't know whether you maybe just want to say a few words about that. Um, okay. Um... In, in SysML, um, concepts can be made abstract. What that means is they're a meaningful concept. You can talk about them, they can have relationships to things, but you can't actually have in the real world an instance of that. An example, you know, completely out of engineering is, is the concept of a mammal. You know, mammal is a real concept. Um, you know, mammals have certain characteristics uh, in, in, in common, but you can't go to the zoo and see a mammal, something that's just a mammal. They don't exist. There's no such thing as a mammal. There are types of mammal. You know, there's, there's cats and dogs and dolphins and 
and all things like that. Uh, so abstract classes are used where we've got, uh, typically like in this example, where we've got a set of, of, of or abstract blocks, sorry, I should say in SysML, I'm giving my UML roots away there. Abstract blocks um, are used uh, where you've got um, lots of, of types. <laughs> This is no pun intended. They're called concrete blocks uh, because they're not abstract, um, where you have um, lots of different sort of types of things that you want to share relationships with. Um, so you want a sort of overarching uh, type that they can all link to, but that you don't ever want an actual one of those overarching types to, you know, to, to exist that you can't create a claimable item. You have to create a claim or an argument or an evidence or, a, or, a, or one of the two links. So that's what abstract classes are and abstract blocks are used for. They're, they're you know, very useful um, modeling elements. Can, um, can I just jump in to, to complement what um, Simon has just said, uh, Stephen? What, um, one of the significant values of the, of the, um, uh, abstract classes or, or, or super types is is to um, organize increasingly large models and, and indeed when it comes to um, significant models with um, tens and hundreds of, of concepts in them um, often the way that they can be presented in a number of different uh, diagrams might be that only to put the class hierarchies in one set of diagrams first of all and then the the various interrelationships in as well. So, um, uh, but it, um, what um, Simon has already said is in, entirely correct. I support that. I just think actually from the point of view of communicating models, there's a value in having supertype, subtype relationships and simply marking that the, sub, the supertypes uh, maybe abstract is a way of informing, as Simon says, that you wouldn't find an instance of that super type in the real world in some cases you, you, you might do but in other cases not but i hope that helps if you might do it can't be abstract i mean it's the same so. yeah 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 uh, absolutely yeah i mean that, that that's a very useful point you know i mean we we've been doing some work for a, a major automotive manufacturer creating a not a pattern a full-blown architecture framework and their ontology now is just ridiculous there's there's probably 70 concepts on it um and some of those are, are, have got multiple subtypes. Um, so on, on the main ontology diagram, we've just essentially got the got the root of the tree because to put all of the subtypes on would just make the diagram, you know, it's pretty much virgin on unusable anyway. Uh, so absolutely, that's right. Okay. Sure. All right, so I think have we're we going to... Have got any more questions? Uh, yeah, I think we can... not, we'll, we'll finish there. Yeah. So uh, we've 